Hey everybody, so we need to talk about lab stuff. First, a very quick introduction to what you're gonna be doing for the majority of the semester in Gen Chem 2, which is called the Qual Scheme or Qualitative Analysis Scheme. And then safety. Um, I am assuming you took Gen Chem 1, so you are more familiar with the safety protocols than a brand new student would be. Um, if that's not the case, you probably should reach out to me and we can go into greater depth in some of these details. I am going to kind of go over things pretty quickly. Um, but each one of these items is essential. And if you don't follow the rules, you just aren't allowed to complete the labs. Okay. I don't want that for anybody. So we're going to work together to make sure everybody is safe. So first, Gen Chem 2 is very, very different from Gen Chem 1. In Gen Chem 1, you had more of what we call cook cookbook chemistry. So you're given a procedure and you just do it. In Gen Chem 2, um, let's see, so it'll be 11 out of 15 lab periods is spent doing an independent project. All right, and so it's essentially three chapters of procedures that you do in this book. Yours is probably not going to be as beat up as mine, I hope, but this is the book. You do need this on the first day of lab, so um, if you don't have it, talk to me. There's some copies you can probably use in the lab, but you do need to have this for your own reference at home eventually because you're going to have to answer questions in each chapter. Um, so essentially what we're doing is chapters 9, 10, and 11, which we refer to as group 1, 2, or 3, respectively, or sometimes the silver group, the copper group, and the aluminum nickel group. Okay. So um, basically the task is to separate a mixture of metals, metal ions to be specific. And uh, so what you're going to do in each chapter is you're going to have a mixture that contains all of the ions. We call this the known because you know everything is in it. And you follow the procedure as it's written. For the most part, there's a few exceptions which are in the reading assignment. You definitely want to check those out. It saves you some time. Um, but largely, all the ions are going to be there. You analyze them. You find the precipitate for each one. So each chapter has a flow chart in it. So for example, this is the flow chart for chapter 11. It's long, but actually this is, this is a lot faster than chapter 10, which has a shorter flow chart. It's just a matter of the kind of chemistry work you have to do. But pretty much the way it works for each flow chart, at the end, you'll have some precipitates. And you can tell which ones are precipitates because, because they're bold. That means a solid, okay? And so when you get to the end of each one of these places, you need to get my signature for each one. Okay. Each of those signatures is worth two points. So that's a nice thing to do. <laughs> then once you have uh, my signature on all the ions, you get an unknown for that chapter. The unknown contains any combination, one, two, three, et cetera, of ions. And so your job is to analyze it and figure out what's in there. We know what's in there, so you are going to be graded on how close to the right answer you get. That's more like what real scientists do. Um, if you're a certified uh, analytical chemist, you get tested routinely by the government or by your employer or both, um, where they give you samples that they know the amount of something in it and you have to get within a certain range of that amount. So that's kind of the purpose here. It teaches a lot of critical thinking, problem solving, and really, really hones in on um, important chemical manipulation skills. So that's the qual scheme. Um, the grading part of it is going to be the unknown, the signatures for each ion in the known, and then there'll be an assignment for each chapter. Okay, so you can see those grading details in the syllabus. It's, it's laid out every single point that you can get. That's in addition to four um, experiments that we are going to do. You, we're going to print those for you. Um, they'll be available on the first day of lab, so check that out. Um, they will be done on specific dates. Otherwise, the qual scheme is, you know, you pick up wherever you left off. It is really, really, really critical that you take 
excellent notes because the way this is going to work um, with social distancing rules is I'm going to need you to leave your notebook and the precipitate at your table and then you're going to have to leave that area so that I can go in and see what ions you have and I have to be able to read your notes and understand them. So there's another document in module four that will give you some guidance on how a lab notebook should look. It doesn't have to match it identically, but the key is you do not want to be writing down observations, which is like amount, texture, color, stuff like that, precipitate forming. You don't want to be writing those kind of things down in advance, right? So sometimes people will go through the the book and read the procedure and copy everything into their notebook. That's not a great idea either because a lot of things are different than what the book says or not a lot of things. Some things are different than what the book says. Um, and again, you can find those changes in the reading assignment. Um, but also, things rarely go exactly how a procedure tells you they will, right? So it makes sense to write down, say, add five drops to test tube one. That's a good thing to do, right? But what doesn't make sense is to predict when you're at home, what, we, what will you see when you get there, okay? So one strategy that works well is to have a column of procedural information. So I did this with this, with this test tube or with this sample, whatever. And then have a column for observations that you fill in in the lab, all right? So anyway, take some, some a look at some of those example um, lab strategies and kind of be prepared to start right away. First day of lab, we get to start on this. So um, I would use that time if I were you, because the sooner you're done with qual scheme, the better off you are. You, you don't have to come to lab for qual days if you're finished, okay? So that's the plan for that. You will have questions as you go. The way that we'll handle that is I will have to come and look at your experiment. I'll have to be able to read your notebook. And then we'll have to have a conversation from six feet away with masks on. All right. It's doable, but it is going to take a little bit of coordination and a bit of patience. Um, if you have questions, raise your hand and, and I'll be there as soon as I can be. Okay. Another thing is that you will have a tray of chemicals at your table and a lot of them are very hazardous. So you need to pay attention to the warnings both in the reading assignment and in the textbook. It has an exclamation point whenever there's a safety issue. Um, if it says to be in the hood, you have to do it in the hood, okay? Um, if it tells you to dispose of the waste in a particular beaker, pay attention to it. Basically, everything goes in one of the waste beakers on your tray. They will be labeled as chapter nine, chapter 10, and chapter 11. Chapter nine is the only one that has mercury waste in it. That's a really important thing to know. You might wanna jot it down somewhere. So when you're working in future labs, if you have mercury waste, it has to go, that is anything with mercury in it, it has to go in the chapter nine waste. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. If you're working in chapter 10, you put it into the chapter 10 waste, okay? So, some of the deviations from the experiment. Chapter nine doesn't have any. Chapter 10 does not contain mercury because we analyze it in chapter nine and like I just said, it's kind of bad. We have to separate that because it's really toxic um, for you and for the environment. So we took it out of chapter 10 since you already analyzed sport in chapter nine. The other thing that we changed is we will not be doing the analysis for cadmium, that's CD. It's on the periodic table behind me. Can you find it? Kind of by my ear. <laughs> we are not gonna be doing the analysis for cadmium because it, it utilizes potassium cyanide, which can create some very toxic gas. We usually do this, this part of the experiment, but we've had to take it out because you can't move around the lab. And if we are gonna use cyanide, it has to be in a separate hood. So that's not gonna work with all of our other experiments going on um, and limited mobility in the lab. So that means um, at the end of procedure 10, so here's our, here's our wonderful procedure. Um, sorry, chapter 10, procedure 10. You're just not gonna do this. And, oops, wrong way, I'm mirrored. 
<laughs> so you can read the page. Um, I said mercury is not in there, so that means none of this is going to happen either. So when you do have to do a part of procedure seven, you're going to have to go there and read really critically and figure out, okay, which part do I have to do to get all the particulars ready for procedure eight, and which part do I not do? And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a hint. Um, the times that are listed in this book, like if it says boil for a minute, it's probably a lie, okay? A lot of the time, you actually have to heat it a lot longer uh, or with more acid, okay? Because as it turns out, whether you're choosing to use um, a hot water bath or a Bunsen burner will affect those, those times. They, I think, used a Bunsen burner, which means you don't have to heat things as long. They're, it's a hotter flame, a more direct flame. So anyway, it's also more liable to burn. So most of the time people use water baths. Um, so we took out mercury, which means part of procedure seven you won't do. We took out um, cadmium, so procedure 10 you won't do, part of it anyway. And then the last thing that we removed is the tin ion because the tin test, which is all the way at the end. Let's see, where do, 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 down here. So we took out this tin SN2 plus because it uses mercury to test for tin. And again, you kind of want to minimize how much mercury we have. Okay. So in place of those parts of the experiment, we are going to do uh, a little assessment of skills for using pipettes and burettes because a lot of us did not get the opportunity to do that in spring 2020. Um, so I'll have a procedure written for that and give it to you at least a week in advance. Um, Hopefully I'll try to find a way to make it fun because we actually need to use that when we do the kinetics experiment. So we have to make sure we have those skills. Okay, so that's the plan. I hope that helps you prepare for um, what's happening. Be sure to read chapter eight. It defines so many things that it will tell you to do in chapter nine. So like it says to decant things, it tells you how to. Um, but as you're working, if you have questions, ask them. Don't wait until something goes wrong. Don't wait until two weeks goes by and you don't have a result, keep on top of things, ask questions, and that's, that's the way to get through.